Hello and welcome or welcome back to a Fancy Weather podcast. I am your host Kirsty Taylor and this week we are talking to Vivek who is a resident here in Edinburgh um, all about his advocacy work in particular um, that obviously he is doing at the moment and we kind of delve into other topics too related to living in the city, living in different places and um, dealing with burnout and advocacy work and things similar to that so I think it's a really 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 fun episode I really enjoyed recording it I think you're all gonna love it so stay tuned for the interview but for now we're gonna hop straight into our intro so enjoy hello everyone welcome back to the pod sorry for the extended break um I am on my summer holidays um, and honestly I thought I'd have better signal in the places I was in to record an episode than I did so my apologies but I am excited to say we're back we're fully back and also we're back big time because we are we are ramping it up to one episode a week so every Sunday you can hear my my glorious voice in your ear so I'll be getting you through your Sunday scaries Monday scaries, whatever it is, every single week. So you're welcome for that. Um, this week we have a guest on, which I'm very excited about. Um, I've also been doing a little bit of thinking and mind mapping. And I think next week we're going to do another Stories of Scotland. And I've decided the the way I'm going to go with that is to look at um, Scottish folklore stories, because that's something I'm super passionate and interested in. And something that I feel like you would all enjoy in the podcast space. So that will be the monthly thing will be stories of scotland um yeah i guess it will be coming out like the last sunday of every month so that's why you'll be getting it next sunday um yeah exciting times i've been meeting with some really cool people for the pod i'm excited about things to come and the weekly episodes and i think it's going to be a really good time and uh yeah i loved having vivek on he had so many interesting things to talk about so do stay tuned for later on in the episode when I have a chat with him and um, for now I'm trying to think of like any life updates Um, obviously I've been away I went cycling with my cousin which was really fun we did the five fairies route got like three punctures classic Christy behavior really but it's fine we survived we cycled the whole way we did it duct tape is your best friend I guess and then I was back for like 24 hours and then I went to Arisag with a friend and had like a really lovely wholesome time and then went to Isle of Skye with my family which was very nice. I've been back in Edinburgh a couple of days and I'm heading off to London um, actually tonight um, but when you're listening to this I will be in London Um, I actually will be my last night in London I guess um, because I'm seeing Naomi who's the co-host of the other podcast I do called Small Talk which now comes out every Saturday um, so check it out if you haven't listened already. It's just small talk on Spotify, all the other places you can find podcasts. Um, and our Instagram is smalltalk.pod. Um, and it's a fun time. We talk about concepts. So far we've done the concept of concepts. And this week we're doing the concept of family, which I've just scheduled to go up and we're recording in person this weekend. So I think we have some fun ones to come. So stay tuned. I'm going to stop self-plugging now because I don't really have anything else to self-plug. Um, yeah, but. I, I guess next weekend I'll be telling you all about London and I will probably be in Ireland maybe I'll record before Ireland I don't know anyway regardless small wonder of the week um is silent friendship time so underrated I actually did a blog post on this a while ago but through the same website that our podcast on so it's fancyableother.com you'll find that blog post all about silent friendship time I think I did it based on a trip that happened earlier on this year but I just think it's so great like with my cousin being away with my other friend being away like it was just there's something about it just hits different so I'm shouting it out such a small wonder is silent friendship time which like even for a chatty Kathy like me is fun so that is that is my small wonder um I forgot what else there is to even talk about oh what I'm like no um oh well, my gem of the city this week is um, my friend shouted this one out. I haven't actually been yet, so shout out Stacey if you're listening. Thanks for being an icon. Um, but I'm going to go with her and I'm, when I'm back and I'm very excited. It's called The Bearded Baker um, here in Edinburgh and it's like her favorite brunch place and I've been like 
looking at their Instagram and it looks amazing. Their Instagram's them at Bearded Baker Scott and they specialize in bagels, buns and donuts, which honestly say say less. Like I'm there. I'm sold. Are you kidding? How incredible is that? And the the page is like making my mouth water a lot. So yeah, definitely shouting that out as the gem of the city. Stay tuned on TikTok to find out more about my first trip there. Um TikTok's just at Fancy of Leather. I've been doing some fun things over there and I'm really have got to stop plugging myself today. Um but yes, that is what we're shouting out for the gem of the city this week. And then for my curry in essential, this is like one of the best purchases I've ever made. So um, I love merch, but like merch made by like Etsy sellers and things like that. I don't like like official merch very often. I find it a little in your face and never very well designed. Um, so there's this company, I think they're called the Sunday Dream Company, but I'll have them linked in the show notes because I'm obsessed with them on Etsy and everyone that listens to this podcast knows that I'm big Swifty. And if you're new, then I'm big Swifty. Sorry if you don't like that, but I don't really care. That's just who I am. I mean, my last name is literally Taylor. It was supposed to be this way. And um, I just recently got their folklore fleece and it's not even that cold here, but I'm wearing it right now because it's the coziest, softest thing I've ever owned. And I honestly think I want it for like every single album now because it's adorable. It's like the best thing I've ever owned. Um, So I'm definitely shining that out. As my Korean essential at the moment, I'm living for this fleece so great so iconic um yeah now we're gonna pop into the poem so the poem this week is actually an oldie by emily dickinson but i actually found it in this new book i got because every time i see a poetry book i have to buy one apparently in sky called poems of the sea and it's edited by gabby morgan and the introduction was done by adam nicholson i've been like reading through it a little bit and really enjoying it um it's a fun like fun little pocket book if you're into poems and stuff like that like me so this is an emily dickens dickinson poem called wild nights wild nights <clears throat> wild nights wild nights wild nights wild nights where i with thee wild nights could should be our luxury futile the winds to a heart in port done with the com- compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea. Might I but moor, tonight in thee. Yeah, so like I said, wild nights, wild nights, with an exclamation at the end. By Emily Dickinson. We love her, an icon. And that is pretty much all I have for you for our intro this week. Um, stay tuned for the chat with Vivek. I think you're all going to love it. Um, super cool guy with really fun recording with him. And yeah, don't forget to check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Fancy Bleather. Head to the website, fancyableather.com. If you're loving the show, please like subscribe or um, follow depending on which podcast platform you're listening on. Um, leave us a review that's all super nice it'll be a lovely summer holiday gift for me Uh, share the podcast with your friend share it online let people know you're listening let people know you're loving it I'd appreciate that let's build a little community yeah but uh yeah let's hop right into it Okay, so for this week's charity of the week, I am shouting out an arts charity that I've recently found out about that I'm a fan of um, called Impact Arts, and uh, their mission is tackling inequalities through creative en- engagement. They deliver impactful creative product projects that enrich lives and consistently strive to improve well-being, improve life chances, foster creativity, engage people, empower communities, and combat loneliness and um, they help develop positive change through creativity over the last year they've engaged over 7,000 people delivered over 3,000 workshops and sent out 800 creative art packs 
And they've also ensured that 81% of the young people they work with move on to positive destinations, which is absolutely incredible to hear all about. To find out more about Impact Arts, you can just head to their website, impactarts.co.uk. And on there, you can find out more about what they do, ways that you can take part, ways you can support them, any news they have going on right now. Um, if you want to venue hire or if you just want to get in contact or maybe you even just feel like you would like to donate this year, then you can do that. So like I said, it's just impactarts.co.uk and I'm sure if you just look them up on social media, they have like Instagram and Facebook and I'd imagine it would just be Impact Arts. Yeah, so check it out. Hello Vivek and welcome to Fancy a Blather podcast. How are you doing today? Well, I mean, I'm fine. Um, yes, uh, yes, I should have known better to trust buses showing up on time on a Sunday morning, but it's a, it's a lovely day out. The thunderstorms haven't started yet, so um, it's just a bit of a nice, albeit humid day. Yeah, the thund- it's kind of been all over the place, the weather recently. Like It's been very hot and then there's been thunder and then it's been hot and then there's been thunder. Um, also, I always forget about like Sunday service being a thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, even I've, uh, so a Norwegian friend of mine once said to me that uh, there, like, there's this Norwegian proverb that goes, mm-hmm. there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad dress, mm. uh, which I think is interesting. Um, and given that, uh, it's, for me, I think the weather is just a state of mind at this point. Um, yeah, fair. But uh, as long as I don't miss a bus and get stuck in a thunderstorm later today, I'll, I'm happy to roll the dice on how I'm getting home. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, but before we kind of get into more about you, can you tell our listeners your small wonder for this week? I mean, I am really excited about this because this is literally something that happened this span of the week. But uh, my small wonder of the week, I'd say, is uh, swimming. Um, oh, nice. Because uh, I think uh, on Monday was the first time in 15 years that I'd gone swimming. Oh, wow. uh, because, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've had like over a decade's worth of body images used to get over because of the toxic masculinity in the school I went to. Um, and then I think there are some people I knew who just mentioned that they would be, had been swimming a lot recently or whatever. And um, my flatmate mentioned the swimming pool around the corner from our flat had opened up recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just woke up on Monday realizing that it's been 15 years since I'd gone swimming. And you know what? It's kind of bullshit that I've let the, all those issues stop me from doing something I used to enjoy. So work was kind of quiet. So I managed to like clock off early, go got some like swimming stuff from Decathlon and then went to the pool around the corner and went swimming for the first time in 15 years and then very quickly became that person who has uh overnight oats in the fridge every, like overnight <laughs> so i can um you know have a banana in the morning and go swimming first thing and come back and have my overnight oats for breakfast and then go to work and yeah it's uh, astonishing how rapidly my lifestyle has changed to incorporate that uh but yeah it feels great it feels great to finally do something i used to enjoy and feel a lot more fit because of the exercise that I'm doing consistently now Um, and it is incredibly satisfying to know that I have gotten over some issues that prevented Mm -hmm. me from doing something Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed Uh, so yeah that's that's been that's been my small wonder of the week which I suppose telescopes 15 years worth of issues yeah nice that's cool though I actually am also that person but I don't have time to come back so I take my overnight oats to work and I have my breakfast before the children arrive, like whilst I'm working because mm. I can't fit in like the, tra- the travel time. So I very much relate to that. And um, what pill are you going to? Uh, um, it's the one around the corner just to go uh, in uh, Warrender. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's a really nice pill. Yeah. Uh, I only discovered recently that because it's an old Victorian pool, the length is 20, 25 yards and not 25 meters. Oh, so um, the other day, I'm like, how far can I actually go? Can I can I do like 40 lengths? Because that's a thousand meters. Mm. Like, oh, great. I've done a thousand meters. And then I read, uh, hang on, 20, 25 yards, not meters. OK, I'm about 80 meters short then. It's all right, though. It's still, but yeah, it's still, still a nice pool. A it's way. well lit. It's not overcrowded. Um, because, yeah, it's probably yeah. one of the best in the city, actually, because it is one of the older. Yeah. It's like really nice that they kept it pretty pretty similar to like how it was in the past. And so. they renovated recently as well. I think they only reopened really? last month. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to like, check it out again. Yeah, I've always liked that pool. Um, can you give our listeners kind of like an elevator pitch of yourself, like who you are, where you're from, like what you do, just like a quick... 
Uh, right. Uh, it's, it's all the hard. It's all it's, the hard questions. Yeah, <laughs> you can kind of tell how badly I do at job interviews with uh, how I'm gonna answer this. <laughs> uh, so I think very very basic introduction. I I guess I just say I'm a massive nerd and I uh, I work as a caseworker for an advocacy charity and I'm from Chennai, which is in the south of India. Uh, and I came to Edinburgh to study in 2011. Uh, took successive degrees here and then and just ended up finding circumstances in which I stayed in the city um, It's one of those things where I'm not really sure if I've grown on the city or the city's grown on me uh, I suppose it's oh, a bit of both I love that's a great way to put it and um, what kind of first and led you to Edinburgh what first Made you interested by Edinburgh like what was the first kind of pull that you had towards it? Well, um the naive answer is all the sort of literature-based tourism that you find in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. where, oh, I'm studying English, I want to study English literature, where do I go? Okay, there's the city here that is kind of very much obsessed with its literary history um, and its ongoing sort of literary heritage and its place within the publishing industry. The book festival, the university itself having this historic literature department and everything mm. um so that was the sort of superficial draw at the time and you know coming here as an international student there's a lot about the city and its context and the sort of culture around it that i didn't know about in detail and mm -hmm. i only learned about when i moved to the city and eventually acclimatized to it um but then the other thing that was a huge draw was uh, <laughs> this is going to be the kind of most anticlimactic answer, but the Scottish degree system and the flexibility it affords okay. to mix and match different de degree combinations more flexibly than degrees mm -hmm. down in England would. So originally I entered the wrong course code on my UCAS application and accidentally was studying linguistics and English literature, um, where I really wanted to study uh, English literature by itself. Uh, but then I got really interested in the philosophy modules that were offered um, as option courses, not the mm -hmm. core ones, because the core philosophy curriculum is very white and very narrow in the mm. British universities, particularly Edinburgh University. Mm -hmm. But some of the option courses were fascinating. So I took I took combined honors philosophy and English. So I could pick the option courses I really liked and had to sk I could just skip all the core courses that I that didn't appeal to me. Um, and that flexibility was something that I found really interesting because just the way my mind worked, I needed to think across different disciplines. I couldn't just um, silo myself in just one specific field. Uh, so that was why Edinburgh University itself was most appealing. Um, and then it was just like funding. I got funding for my master's and PhD, which was really nice and made a lot of decisions e much easier for me. Uh, and my supervisors were amazing. Um, they were some incredibly inspiring academics who uh, are some of the few academics I've worked with whose ethics actually match their research and they follow through mm -hmm. in their own activism and in their own um, their, uh, work outside of academia. Um, the kinds of principles they talk about in their research and I don't know I think seeing how academia can be written, can be reified and hypocritical at worst mm -hmm. and sometimes actively exploitative of the knowledge and the resources of the global south um, having colleagues who were much more self-aware about this and much more aligned to critique the system and address the inequalities was something which for me was a huge ethical draw to studying here um, and then the city itself. I got to know a lot of people, saw the city for what it is, and found communities and spaces that I felt I belonged in and uh, had some um, friends who are a very impor important and integral support network. So, you know, it's a bit of both. The city growing on me, me growing into the city. Like yeah. I said. Um, you spoke earlier about the climatization of for me to the city. So, like, obviously that was a while ago. We're kind of thinking back. What were kind of some of the bigger cultural shocks that you experienced like in coming here were there things that kind of surprised you or things that you were like oh yeah that that makes sense and what was kind of the the mental health experience of that like how did you navigate that um so for me the weirdest thing was um in terms of the culture shock um the culture shock itself wasn't that big because mm -hmm. you know uh coming from a like you know middle class family in india it's like both my parents are physicians we uh the environments I grew up in were um, very similar to the kind of environment that I'd acclimatized to here. Okay. Um, the 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 difference was, uh, I mean, in, in the difference was things that I only realized in hindsight, which was a combination of um, being in a different environment that I hadn't really acclimatized to before and having to navigate that 
prior to understanding my own autism and ADHD. Um, so navigating these environments and not realizing that there is a whole raft of unwritten codes and scripts that I hadn't internalized because of which I found myself in my, myself in environments that were fundamentally hostile to me and not really having the understanding to um, articulate my experience or navigate that those, those spaces. And then I suppose the obvious elephant in the room, the racism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, it's a number of things, a number of, a number of overt things. Like I think last year, I, I think I had what, three hate crimes in one summer. I was assaulted by a woman on the, on the beach who loosed her dog on me. Uh, a random guy threw a drink at me as he drove past and uh, was, uh, oh yeah, I was um, uh, harassed on a train back from a friend's wedding um, because I was in traditional Indian dress because it was a friend of mine who I knew from India. So um, I was a bit of a target. But anyway, you know, it's like uh, three hate crimes in one summer is a bit much. Um, but even otherwise, um, the subtle things, the way people react and behave in um, ways that specifically perceive um, behaviors by brown people as malicious or hostile mm -hmm. um, and they'd be more normal and accepting if the same kind of behavior came from white people like those kinds of double standards which I only realized when other friends of mine kind of pointed it out to me because if you don't realize these things you, if you don't have the language or experience to be able to recognize these patterns you're not going to have the insight to understand this or articulate that. Yeah. Um, and these are things I only became aware of in hindsight that, you know, things like how when I, for example, when I was involved with uh, university societies and the societies would throw a ball, I was one of the few non-white people and the only brown person there. And not a single photograph of me exists in that event. Mm -hmm. There's a picture someone took of my tie, but not, but not my actual face. And this has been, and you know, it's like other similar experiences I've had like this where you could kind of tell when you as a brown person are being tokenized in the room, like a bunch of white friends of mine were having a flat party and uh, I think there was like streaming music or something and a Spotify advert came on where it said, you can volunteer to go do charity work in like India and Africa and other countries. And, yeah. and you know, a bunch of the white kids, they heard that joke is, oh yeah, you know, Africa is my favorite country. Let's go to, you know, what's the capital of Africa? South Africa, etc. Quite obviously taking the piss because, you know, it's a bit of a running gag about how the tourism and volunteerism industry kind of makes a mockery of this whole thing. And I'm like, whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're having a laugh. I'd be in on the joke as well, but honestly, I, I, I've got more important things to laugh about. But then all of them turned to me and said, I hope you're not offended oh, because I was the only non-white person there. And, they, and it's like, that makes it yeah. worse. Yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 I, I've, it's, it's only in hindsight where I recognize these things and the racism that underpins all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but funnily enough, growing up in Chennai, I was, no, I was no stranger to the racism and discrimination I faced there because the school I went to was one that was overrun by Tamil Brahmins. And there's a huge caste problem in, uh, in Chennai um, where if you're not Brahmin, you're going to face a lot of discrimination subtly and overtly. Uh, at least this was the case when I lived in Chennai many, many mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, I used to, there was a time when I was going to my classroom and some kids just got up and sort of blocked me from going there and said, what's going on? My classroom is just down that corridor. And they said to me, no, no, you can't go there because we see that you eat meat in your packed lunch and we're Brahmins and we don't want you contaminating our space. And how do I get to my classroom? Then it's just down that corridor. Oh, just go upstairs, go across the corridor on the other side and go down and then go to your classroom. Right, fine. And then, you know, my parents always taught me to be very non-confrontational and yeah. whatever. Uh, and I didn't realize that that was caste-based discrimination where contamination and, you know, this hardcore vegetarianism and seeing contact with people who eat meat as being contaminating was one of the ways in which caste-based discrimination was practiced in, in Chennai, in, in the school I was in. And this is something that was actively aided and abetted and condoned by the teachers. Like, the, con the teachers would tell off anyone who ate meat for sitting near Brahmins and meat eaters. Yeah. And, you know, there were, there were some times when it was just ridiculous, where there was the, these Brahmin kids who were made to sit close to the front of the classroom, and the kids who weren't Brahmins were made to sit further back. And even when the Brahmin kids were really tall and we couldn't see anything behind this person, uh, one of my classmates said to our teacher that, you know, I, I can't see, can, we, can I be swapped to a seat in front? And the teacher said, well, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't cut his head off for you, so you'll need to grow taller. Instead of the easy what? solution of like That's swapping chain, seats. Yeah. But no, all the Brahmin people had to sit together because, you know, they had visible markers of Brahminism in terms of the, the, the sacred thread that they wear, yeah. the kind of, um, the kind of pillocks that they'd have on their head and stuff. 
so like, there were just these obvious things. And after having grown up with all of that, I think for me, it wasn't so much a culture shock because, like I said, I was used to so many things in the environment. Mm-hmm. It's just the specific basis on which these discriminations were practiced were things that I wasn't used to, which is why it was quite difficult acclimatizing to it. But then it was also illuminating to realize all of these kinds of discrimination. And, you know, all the things I told you about caste and stuff, I only figured that out in my mid-twenties because of the racism I experienced here and realized, Mm -hmm. hang on a second, I'd gone through all of that when I was in Chennai. But that's the same thing. It's just that was a that was casteism by proxy. Okay. And yeah. So Yeah, it's just a little like very eye opening. Mm -hmm. Um how did that all kind of impact your mental health? Like when did you kind of take the time to recognize the impact of that experience in your life? Uh, I, it's, it's one of those things where things started falling into place after my autism diagnosis, because mm-hmm. then it was a, oh, here are so many things I took for, uh, the, so many things I couldn't understand, so many unwritten rules I just struggled with, but just adapted to, to mask and not cause a problem. But mm-hmm. now that I think about it, and then things started falling, a lot of things started falling into place. Uh, a lot of the racism and stuff and the casteism, they started falling into place, um, years before that. Um, so it was all in a sort of, um, I think, and then I think that was also very close to when I had a lot of, I made a lot of non-white neurodivergent friends in, in Edinburgh, Mm -hmm. um, because when I was mostly in my environments as a student, my friend groups are very, 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 very white. Um, but, um, I think eventually I came to terms with this when I was surrounded by people who had similar experiences as me and, um. Um, and and I suppose it helps to have friend groups that are predominantly neurodivergent and queer um, in the sense that, you know, Bell Hooks is a definition of queer as mm-hmm. not determined by your sexuality or your sexual orientation, but a fundamental state of being where you find yourself fundamentally at odds with the world around you. Yeah. And having friends who were in that kind of environment really made me question and rethink a lot of my experiences and have that insight and understanding. And that, yeah, I suppose that relatability, so then the empathy is a lot more in play in your friend groups whereas like previously was it more of a struggle uh less of empathy i suppose more of of understanding i think it's more of an oppositional disposition towards the kinds of things that people would otherwise take for granted Mm -hmm. you know when you have a bunch of neurotypical and queer friends and you come across something or the other and they start questioning the assumptions that are inherent within the ways in which things operate uh thinking off the top of my head uh when i was mentioning how uncomfortable i was about uh uh, some things that were said at the uh, at a wedding that i attended and within about 10 minutes we'd gone from oh you know i was at at a wedding and these things happened to um okay so you know the um the society we live in today is one that is structurally uh, prejudiced in favor of nuclear families which mm-hmm. undermines um, relationships that are outside of a very heteronormative patriarchal mm-hmm. uh, norm and um, you know that has led to a wider impoverishing of our community and a privatization of space and we should be looking at abolishing the idea of a household and a you know uh, private space and think more in terms of commons and community and more radical and anarchist ways of organizing um, it helps to have conversation that goes from zero to 60 that quickly Um, because then you start really questioning the kinds of um, hierarchies and norms that you exist within. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. How did you come to get involved with um, advocacy work? Was activism kind of something that has always been in your life? Was it a more recent thing? And how did that kind of lead to working in that field? What was kind of the draw for you? This is is something which... uh, I mean, I I find this very tricky to uh, answer because it's one of those things where I can never really draw a clear line around. Because to my mind, it just doesn't make sense logically to not try and change things that you cannot accept. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not to be all serenity prayer about this or anything, but um, um, I think for me, it's just... uh, there have been activists in my family, um, but mm-hmm. sadly, I never actually interacted with them in an environment where I was also an adult and had more of a political understanding and education. Mm-hmm. Because uh, my granddad uh, was an activist um, during the sort of 
um, independence movement in India. Yeah. Uh, my aunt was an activist uh, for like women's and children's welfare in the state of Odisha. Um, and I think I sadly that both of them passed away just uh, uh, um, at times when I wasn't really able to benefit from any of the wisdom or insight that they'd had, which is quite sad. But when I was at university, I think, you know, it's, it was one of those things where as an adult having having the autonomy and independence to think about these things mm -hmm. and having an education that you know, I came, I went to a very privileged posh school in India where I had very radical left wing teachers who were making me um, who were challenging me on my own prejudices and privileges and making me seriously reconsider my place in society and the ethical obligations that came with the kinds of resources and abilities that a lot of us had and the mm -hmm. responsibility upon what uh, upon us as you know the kinds of expectations on citizenship and the kinds of duties that were um, enshrined in our constitution all of those things um, and then when I was a student here and I I guess I just found myself in environments where I guess it's an autism thing where I came across something I just didn't understand I realized I didn't understand mm -hmm. it because there was an ethical contradiction that to me just was unacceptable and then the logical ex like extrapolation of that was well that is terrible I need to change that and I used to volunteer a lot for various organizations um, as an undergrad there was a um, uh, and then I stopped for a bit in between when I just got overwhelmed with uni stuff mm -hmm. uh, but then during my postgraduate studies I became a union rep when I was uh, teaching at the university and you know continued with being a union rep and then started volunteering for a mental health charity and then started volunteering for another mental health charity um, and then got a job in the sort of advocacy sort of in an advocacy charity afterwards because it just seemed like something I had the ability and skills and resources to do mm -hmm. and so I just felt it's something I should be doing. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think that's a, a great way to answer that. Um, obviously, activism and advocacy and things like that are very, and jobs similar in similar fields are very emotionally taxing. I think some jobs have a lot of physicality to them and take a lot of the grunt of your body they they really break your body down over the years particularly if you think of like construction mm -hmm. workers and jobs similar to that there are a lot of manual labor there's obviously an industry or multiple industries that contain a lot of emotional labor mm -hmm. and obviously i would definitely put advocacy and activism in that category how do you how do you kind of continue to ensure that you're prior prioritizing your own mental health in some way whilst also having to exert that emotional labor because i also can imagine that it's probably a job that's hard jobs that are emotionally laboring are hard to leave at the door manual labor is easier i would argue to leave at the door emotional labor is something you carry with you in a different way and it's something that is harder to to push past and i'm sure it's something where you get home and you think there's 10 million things i could be doing right now how do you find that like how do you turn off from that experience um, or is that something you're still well um, I mean it's it's always something that you know we all need to sort of be mindful of and work on yeah. um, and, uh, throughout because it's not the kind of thing which you just figure out and suddenly that's it's no longer a problem oh yeah definitely um, I think there's something about the way my brain works that suits this kind of work mm -hmm. because um, I think it's part part of it is the you know the weird overlap between autism and ADHD where there are times when I find I can compartmentalize things very well and you know i'm at work i've got multiple different clients i'm working with and i've got you know reports to write or something and i go through phases where i can hyper focus for an, half an hour to an hour on a specific task and then just suddenly switch gears and just roll around uh, doing multiple things and then i come back home and suddenly i've completely absorbed myself in i don't know playing corf ball or mm -hmm. like, uh, playing video games or just programming or something programming is a massive time sink i find i just derealize and just like evaporate into lines of code if I take up a programming project mm -hmm. which is slightly worrying and I've kind of tried to control that hobby a bit more because I lose track of time very quickly if I'm mm -hmm. like writing Python code but um, yeah so because of that I find I'm just better at just absorbing myself in specific tasks and when I'm, when I'm home because I'm surrounded by other stimuli that are not work related I find it's very easy for me to distract myself with things that are at home and keep my mind away from work there are times when in the weekends, if I've got nothing to do, if I've you know cleaned up, if I've done all the chores for the weekend and 
sometimes I find thoughts about work starting to intrude my headspace again. But um, other than that, I find the stimuli that I have are very easy to keep me focused on other things. Mm -hmm. So the strategy I use is managing the stimuli around me. So, you know, I keep my Kindle around me. I have mm -hmm. my Nintendo Switch plugged into the telly. I make plans to meet up with people and mm -hmm. I have a tabletop gaming thing I go to every few weeks. So there are things that I do that keep me like give, that give me a routine that ensures that I have the stimuli that drives draws my mind away from work. Um, and I've also got a lot of space where I can talk about the issues I deal with at work. Uh, my manager and I um, see eye to eye on a lot of issues and have the same values. So when we are confronted with a challenging and emotion demanding problem, we talk about things, we figure out solutions. And uh, my workplace is actually very supportive of my well-being. And you know, there have been times when a manager said, you, you've been dealing with a lot this week. Just take the rest of the day off. Just go home, relax, mm -hmm. enjoy the sun. You know, you've been doing enough give yourself time uh, you have done a lot of work in a short space of time you don't need to stay till five o'clock if you've done all your work all that. so that's that's there as well um, so a lot of different things um, different strategies managing the stimuli I get but also making sure the support network that I have in place at work and outside mm -hmm. are quite robust and supportive amazing um, there's kind of been an overlying an underlying rather um, theme throughout this episode and I've found speaking to guests in general throughout every episode on the podcast of the um the sense of community in people's lives and like the importance of community which i think is something that's not really spoken about a lot is that like cultivating that community and the importance of community in people's lives what has kind of your experience been with community particularly in living in edinburgh like how have you come to kind of find a place in communities how has that benefited you like what has that experience been Oh, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a tricky one. I, I mean, um, I think, um, one of the things that really made me appreciate the value of community has been, um, you know, the last however the hell many years I've lived in this city, uh, there have been times when, um, it was really the, the, the kindness and generosity of the people mm -hmm. around me that had helped me through some horrifically difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first came to this country, you know, it was literally landed in the airport, massive suitcases. Fortunately, it was, you know, freshers week. So the university had this kind of welcome sort of service yeah. at the airport where there were some volunteers who pointed me to the taxi rank was and I came to the, um, and it was a horrifically isolating time because, you know, I was autistic and didn't know it. I was a brown person in a very, uh, in an environment that was unfamiliar to me and a lot of people perceived me in ways that were um, quite driven by prejudice and you know particularly per perceiving the kinds of faux pas that were because autistic person doesn't quite understand social cues but then because it's a brown autistic person it's seen as specifically malicious and that kind of sh like mm -hmm. racism um, um, so you know that it was I had a horrifically isolating time but there were a handful of friends that I made that were quite that were quite integral to my time there. Um, so I spent a lot of time as an undergrad very isolated, but eventually um, when I was a postgrad, I, I think I just started, I took up corfball as a sport mm -hmm. and a uh, bunch of other things like tabletop role playing as a hobby. And during that time, there were people I met who were just um, incredible. Um, uh, it was funny taking up a sport after all the issues I had with sport when I was at school. I was always a massive nerd. I was a decent track athlete, but um, yeah, I was not particularly skilled at sport. But then I realized that's because no one actually gave me coaching that was adapted to my neurotype and my learning style and all mm -hmm. that. Um, but the people I met and the communities that I became part of were quite integral to just the support networks I had. And there were times when, for example, when I was moving into my flat, I was evicted illegally by a previous landlord. And I didn't know that I could just call their bluff and stayed and they couldn't have done anything because they'd have to take us to court but they wouldn't because mm -hmm. they'd lose that uh, I didn't know my rights at the time so uh, unfortunate but they were banking on that but anyway so I moved into this place where I'm living now and I had some friends who helped me last minute to like offer me a place to stay while they were away from the summer helped me move my stuff because their their parents were driving through and they had a car they could use so they helped mm -hmm. me move and uh, a, a course mate of mine uh, from my masters um, who used to work as a removals man before he um, started his masters 
uh, basically just help me move all my stuff in exchange for just yeah. buying him a pint the next week. Yeah. Um, and they were just like absolutely lovely people who helped me live in this city. Uh, and then, you know, many years later when the pandemic happened, we got to the point where it, re it emphasized the value of these kinds of communities. And because mm -hmm. I had friends who cared about me, that when I had COVID, a friend dropped off care packages for me, or when someone else was ill, you know, someone else came and stepped in and took them food and stuff. Um, you realize in times of crisis just how important those support networks and those individual people are um, because every person is you know, interdependent on so many others and, mm -hmm. uh, and being aware of those relationships and how there are relationships outside of ones which you would normally build society around were quite revealing. Like the whole thing about families and households, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how you'd have one household and you were allowed one other household as a bubble. But when you're a flat share of four people, that makes it more complicated because the kind of bubble you have is much more complex because there are different people have different connections. Yeah. Uh, and then you realize that you know one person really relies on these other people for their support network and you can't really cut them off from them, but then you've all got to choose one. And, and then you, you suddenly realize... Like just, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's um, you realize the value of different relationships when you're in... Uh, when everything's atomized and you've got to rethink how people in society help each other. Uh, I don't know if this really helps answer that question about community and how you find it, but I think for me, the importance of community is something that's always quite valuable because mm -hmm. uh, I I don't really see any problems to any of the big pro any solutions or big problems that we face. That I don't think the solutions are solutions that will be top down. I think it's always about grassroots and community mobilizing and organizing. Mm -hmm. Like the biggest example for community for me was um, the the deportation raids that happened in Glasgow. Yeah. And an entire neighborhood sort of um, rallied together and blocked the deportation vans um, mm -hmm. and stopped that deportation from going through. And that's just an example of how something as violent and oppressive as the hostile environment and you know, Preeti Patel and her horrific, brutal racism that has now just been solidified and continued, uh, which you know, goes all the way back to Theresa May. Like, the, whole, the Tories have a long history of that kind of horrific yeah. brutality. Um, the solution to that was grassroots mobilizing and organizing and that can look like any number of things like um, you know people helping each other with um, accessing their rights giving them support um, so the hostile environment as a policy is designed to alienate people from their access to their rights mm -hmm. so um, in England banks schools universities landlords all of them are co-opted by the state to police your immigration status. Mm -hmm. So banks should freeze your accounts unless you can prove your immigration status. Mm -hmm. Landlords should not let you rent property unless you can prove your immigration status with the right to, right to, le right to rent. Employers shouldn't hire you unless you can prove your documentation, which means every single person in, this, in society is being co-opted by the state to act as immigration police. The solution to that is every single person who's in contact with someone helping other people access their rights. Now, you, you know someone who's going through an appeal for their immigration status and they can't access their own bank account because of immigration bullshit. To be fair, I think that policy has been repealed, I, but mm -hmm. uh, it was never a problem in Scotland anyway, but whatever. Um, help them. Yeah. Someone's being evicted by their landlord because documentation issues. Help them. Because every individual can play a part in protecting others from the brutality of the state. Mm -hmm. um, and you... And, yeah, and that's that's how we fight back against this and you know when you asked me earlier about activism for me it's just a fundamental state of being that people need to look after each other because st the state and institutions that we rely on fail people who are most vulnerable yeah absolutely no i think that's a great point you mentioned um korth ball briefly um i just figured we should probably explain what that is for people listening <laughs> in case they're not yes. familiar with korth ball what what is that uh, what does it involve <laughs> So, um, in the year 1921, there was a PE teacher in the Netherlands who's, honestly, whose name I should remember because I give this spiel to so many people that it's kind of a terrible mission on my part to not know this. <laughs> but um, this was a sport invented in 1921 in the Netherlands um, that is a mixed-sex indoor uh, ball sport that is designed to be similar to basketball. Like Korf is Dutch for basket. Um, uh, the defining features of the sport are that it is mixed sex, so teams have to have an equal number of men and women on the teams um, in each half. 
Uh, it is a role equal sport, so you have an equal number of men and women on each half of the team. There's an attacking half a def- and a defending half, mm-hmm. and then every two roles you swap halves, so everyone oh, covers okay. all roles. Unlike netball, where you play in specific zones yeah. and roles, uh, here it's um, much more sort of um, equal in terms of the roles that you play. It's just um, categorized by the time you spend in that role. Um, another aspect of the of the sport is that it is about um, uh, cooperation and teamwork. So um, you are not allowed to run with the ball. You can only hold the ball and pivot or throw. Mm-hmm. Um, and you are not need you you do not need to physically overpower your opponent. So as long as your defender is actively marking you within arm's reach of you. Um, you are not allowed to shoot. It doesn't matter if they cannot reach the ball if they're a foot shorter than you. As long as they're within arm's reach and they're actively marking you, you're not allowed to shoot. If you shoot, the ball turns over. So the premise of the game is about tactical passing sequences mm-hmm. and maneuvers. Uh, so you cooperate with your teammates. And most importantly, and this is the most counterintuitive aspect of the sport, um, you're only allowed to mark opponents of the same sex. Um, and that is to encourage equality and cooperation. Because the idea behind this is that a male player cannot then physically dominate all their opponents. Mm-hmm. They have to cooperate with their phys- their female teammates in order to get past their opponent. So, you know, um, if you're a particularly strong, dominant male player, you cannot m- block the female players of the opponent team, um, yeah. the opposing team. So you have to cooperate with your female teammate to have a solid defensive formation. Now, mm-hmm. having said all of this, this was a sport that whose idea of gender equality was very much rooted in the 1920s, the sport is having issues with the way it approaches gender inclusion when it comes to trans athletes and non-binary athletes. And there are different schools of thought, different debates happening all over korfball. Um, I would really like to see korfball becoming a sport that is truly gender equal and finds a way of articulating its rules that do not rely on a sex-based categorization of players, but still can create some kind of arbitrary division of players. So you, mm. can, you can still can have that division. more of an equity rather than an equality. Exactly. Because, you know, it's like if I'm playing against a man who is six foot five, that is no more or less unfair than if I'm playing against a woman who is six foot five. And mm. the rules would say one of them is more fair than, other, than, the, than the other. Uh, difference, the internal variants within sexes are often, you know, as prevalent as the differences across them. Um, but also given that the rules are very much mitigating physical contact, it's a controlled contact sport, so mm-hmm. you're not actually allowed to make physical contact. Um, it's, I, I think there's an argument to be made that korfball could be a sport that is not, not sex effect, affected or gender affected, and so can be a sport that can be more inclusive. Like roller derby is a sport that is, you know, like is completely mm-hmm. mixed and doesn't segregate people based on gender, and it has a lot more contact than korfball. Um, but you know that that's kind of what korfball is. That's also I debates around korfball and gender that I've, I kind of have to, in good conscience, mention because a lot of my friends literally don't want to play korfball because they'd have to misgender themselves to play because non-binary players just don't exist within mm-hmm. the rules. Um, so you know it's uh, it is a it's uh, and yeah the, the Scottish korfball community is also quite active and um, quite fun and there's some lovely people here. Uh, if you're interested in korfball, Edinburgh City Korfball Club train on Wednesdays and in in the summer, and then we'll be training on Wednesdays and Fridays in August. You can look us up on like the internet, um, and the Scottish Korfball Association is always looking for new players and stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the obligatory nice. pitch, and I think that's going to be another like pound in the korfball jar I have to put in when I get home. <laughs> nice. Um, just before we kind of end off the episode, you've spoken quite a lot about um. Um, autism and kind of also mentioned ADHD but I kind of want to focus more on the autism um, and obviously having that diagnose, diagnosis later on in life how did that come to be what was kind of what led to going to receive the diagnosis like what was the kind of process why did that come about I cannot actually believe I get to use some of the some of my PhD research for something that yeah um, so this is what happened uh, back in back when I was a master student I was given a diagnosis of like generalized anxiety disorder and depressive disorder mm-hmm. like oh yeah you, you know, it makes sense in terms of symptoms but I don't think this is addressing the bigger picture because there are things that are making me depressed and anxious uh, and then ba- a lot of back and forth with my GP and my GP suspected that some of the signs I showed were um, and this is where it gets hilarious me like brown cis man uh, being suspected by my GP of having a personality disorder 
which you know um, one of the mental health charities I volunteered for was um, a project about like advocating for people with personality disorders mm -hmm. Uh, and this is a, an experience that is more commonly something women go through, per, autistic women or women with PTSD go through because certain kinds of mental like mental illnesses and certain kinds of neurodivergence in women are pathologized as a personality disorder. And there's a whole plethora of controversy around the effectiveness of the, of the label and whether or not it is it, whether or not it is beneficial. And mm -hmm. there's a whole debate which um, I have been you know swimming in for a long time because of the volunteering work I did back when I was given a personality disorder diagnosis but over time uh, when I was finally after about two and a half years of waiting list for psychology services when I was finally seen by a psychologist um, that diagnosis was um, corrected to an autism diagnosis and there was something genuinely Kafka-esque about this where apparently there was a mix-up in my medical files and somehow so when I first registered, there was an error where a GP thought that um, you know I was autistic and put it on my file. And then when I spoke to my psychologist, and the psychologist said, oh, it says in your file you're autistic. I'm like, no, I'm not. Weren't you diagnosed as a child? No, I wasn't. It says, I think that is an error. And I'm like, oh, what? Yeah, because I never was diagnosed as a child. Like, oh, okay, well, I need to get that corrected then. But whilst you're here, it may be worth doing an autism test. And, you know, mm -hmm. Whatever, I don't think that... And then I did the questionnaire and the screening question. Okay, I think there's we need to do like a proper autism assessment because you scored very highly on the screening questionnaire. I said, ah, did I now? It was generally a, a properly Kafka-esque situation of where the bureaucratic error was eventually mm -hmm. proven right by the diagnosis process. Um, <laughs> and then, um, like, there's a reason why a lot of my PhD sort of research touched upon this, and I think it's because it's something that affected me personally. It's this concept of epistemic justice. And epistemic justice is this uh, field of inquiry that explores how injustice is, oper uh, is manifested in and also challenged uh, by the way in which knowledge is produced and disseminated. Mm -hmm. So knowledge itself can be a powerful tool of maintaining and challenging injustice. Um, and there are two types of uh, epistemic injustice, broadly speaking. Uh, one of them is the kind of injustice where someone else's opinion of you is taken more seriously. In my case, there was a GP who suspected I had a personality disorder or didn't even think that I was autistic. Uh, or, you know, growing up, I was always seen as a clever but difficult child. And a lot mm. of teachers loved and hated me for similar reasons. Um, but they all, there was a teacher who used very ableist slurs, you know, including the R slur, and had a very mm. public altercation with my parents in the courtyards of my school. The day I was leaving my school in Chennai because I moved to Dehradun, uh, and, you know, like the teacher said that I needed to uh, go to a special needs school because I didn't be belong in mainstream education. Um, uh, incidentally, that teacher's favorite comeback every time I'd correct her on something because I was reading something in my spare time and, and I'd learned about English, like vocabulary and like language uh -huh. and sentence structure that she wasn't aware of, that she'd say to me, who the hell do you think you are? Do you have like a PhD in English or something? And I can now say to her, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, all that spite notwithstanding. Um, that teacher and a lot of people's, you know, um, opinion of me as someone with you know, insert ableist slur here issues. Um, and the GP who had a very particular opinion of me based on his assessment, that was taken more seriously than my own lived experience. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect of um, what's called testimonial injustice, when someone else's testimony is given more power than your own. Um, the second kind, and that's the kind which I find more interesting from an advocacy point of view, is called hermeneutical injustice. And that is when, and we alluded to this at the start, when you don't have the understanding or knowledge of something, uh, it makes it impossible for you to articulate your experiences and advocate for yourself and seek access to your own rights. When I didn't know I was autistic, I didn't know what kind of support I could ask for at the mm -hmm. university or anything else. Uh, I eventually got diagnosed halfway through my PhD and I was able to go to my supervisor and say, right, I need adjustments. My supervisor said, okay, uh, formal adjustments are going to be tricky for us to assess. Why don't we just play it by ear? You tell me what you need and we can work around that because my PhD supervisor was absolutely brilliant and he was very flexible in the way he worked with me and he said, look, your needs will change over time. If you need me to give you periodic meetings and reminders just so you keep writing, that's fine. If I'm not going to hear from you for six weeks and you're suddenly going to send me 15,000 words, that's fine. Tell me how you feel. Let's meet up and mm -hmm. you know, check in and see how that goes. Uh, and even my current employer, we don't have like a formal agreement on adjustments. Mm -hmm. It's a whole case by case strategy of, right, this is how my brain's working. I need these days where I just focus on this. I need this time mm -hmm. off because I'm burnt out and we just work around that. There's probably a lot of a more effective way to exactly. view it because it is 
a subjective thing. Exactly. Like autism is not different in every exactly. person in every way they exist. Precisely. So having something exactly. personal is absolutely and that is where right way to do it. and that is where if you have a one size fits all solution you fall back into the testimonial injustice of a one size fits all model of autism that is given more importance than individual lived experiences mm -hmm. um so you know and that's why the epistemic justice stuff was something i find personally quite appealing because it's it's very close to my own lived experience um and the process with which i went through this um this assessment was a series of interminable waiting lists mm -hmm. and um it's uh, it's one of those things where um the actual process of it was fairly mundane where it was just uh, finally got to the front of the waiting list had a series of appointments with um uh with a, with psych, psych, psychologist and then eventually went to the so the, the autism support charity in edinburgh number six where i went to some of their support groups and i realized that actually the things i need aren't the things i'll be getting here because this caters to very specific needs that a lot of autistic mm -hmm. people who've been recently diagnosed have um and that's where my my community of friends where i think when when we first had this group first came together over like board games and stuff there were half of us who had a formal diagnosis of something and then it became a running gag of oh you want you want to know whether or not you're autistic well you're friends with all of us so chances <laughs> are you know neuro neurodivergent people flock together yeah um so yeah uh but then it was less the diagnosis and more the understanding that made a huge difference in my life and made me understand the challenges I was facing and the problems I was having with understanding the way people interact with each other and you know the way mm -hmm. people communicated and all those things uh, and it helped me learn how to adapt behaviors which other people would find difficult about me but also recognize situations where there were injustices and inequalities that were affecting me and how I could address them but then at the heart of all of this and I think this is what made the most sense to me was the anxiety and depression I alluded to and the fundamental question of why am I anxious and depressed, mm -hmm. I realized that there were structural things that contributed to this. And this gave me the insight in recognizing those structures. So um, um, Mark Fisher, the, sort of the literary critic, uh, he, paraphrasing very broadly, he said that, you know, we acknowledge that mental health, like mental illnesses in society are quite prevalent. And, um, you know, like people explain depression as the, the having whatever chemical imbalance in the brain yeah. but, but what exactly leads to those chemical imbalances there's a sociological and political explanation we need for that that is not to say that you know for a lot of people who um, have physiological issues that lead to their mental like lead to their experience of mental illness and need pharmaceutical intervention um, to support that isn't a legitimate experience but the point is that a lot of those experiences are exacerbated by barriers in our society that are so ableist that it makes it difficult for us to navigate how we manage our own mental health um, and a lot of my colleagues and friends and i um, you know we have very different experiences of our own mental illnesses and own neurodivergence and always being confronted with very reductive solutions where either very aggressively um you know social models of this where we shouldn't be using any kind of medication or not just medicate yourself till you're fine enough to work and that's all we need to do to solve mm -hmm. the problem alienate and isolate people and um and getting this diagnosis was really i think it's a nice way of tying this back together uh realizing my place within a much wider community or realizing the existence of this community of other neurodivergent mm -hmm. people um who have very critical approaches to the structural ableism in our society and the sort of allonormative way in which a lot of our society functions um and people who just come together and question these things um and actively organize and mobilize in different contexts um trade unions that are trying to advocate on disability rights the organization where i work where we're trying to deal with intersectionality from like discrimination and disability mm -hmm. um and you know a lot of um so yeah, that was the, the the experience of getting the diagnosis was far more complex than just the process of getting the diagnosis and figuring out what my issues and neurotypes were it was a much bigger political education of where i am within this wider con context of ableism and neurodivergence yeah no, I think yeah, that's uh, something that's very important to share with the listeners because I think a lot of people, especially now, are starting to recognize neurodivergency in their own lives that maybe is something that has gone unspoken and I think it's become something that's more prevalent in people's lives and is more spoken about in society, which I think is a great step in the right direction. But I think speaking about the, the dangers of the one-size-fits-all is super important to acknowledge because 
it is easy to just do that and say, well, I've checked that box because it is a lot of work in certain fields, especially, I suppose, in educational fields. It is a lot of work to have 28 people in a classroom and want to make sure you're hitting the needs of all of them and that they are not receiving the one size fits all, even if two do have the same diagnosis. I think that's something that is really important to, um, to speak about. So thank you for, for being willing to share that. Um, we we'll just want to end off the episode by asking what is your Korean essential? What is something that like is comforting and cozy to you, even though we are in the warmer months? I think it's still important to have comfort in summer. In fact, I would argue it's more important to have comfort in summer because I don't find the sun very com- comforting, but I know some people do. So um, what is kind of your Korean essential? Uh, you know what? I, I think I I'd thought of something before we started recording. And I, oh, um, yeah. Um, uh, so what I would say is, um, uh, I, m- I mentioned my Kindle earlier. I would say, mm-hmm. um, an ebook reader of some description for me is, um, uh, you know, absolutely vital because, um, uh, it is small, it is portable and you can have different books on it, which means that if, because I'm, you know, finding it hard to concentrate on a kind of book, mm-hmm. I can just read something else instead. Uh, and I've got like four or five books on the fly where it's like, oh yeah, nonfiction about, you know, uh, police abolition and transformative justice on one hand, um, fiction of like, um, I don't know, R.F. Kuang's recent novel mm-hmm. that I'm reading on the other, and um, Ursula Le Guin's translation of the Tao Te Ching, which is just always there. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, oh, I, I, I can't focus on one thing. Let me just see whatever I can focus on. Um, when I was um, in school, uh, when I was doing my final exams, a lot of people would joke that they'd, they'd try and play like the equivalent of Where's Wally, of trying mm-hmm. to spot where in the campus I'm kind of hiding away with my Kindle just reading because I got one for Christmas when I was in uh, my final year in school and it was just absolutely delightful to be able to just read so much um, wherever I went yeah. and have like different things to choose from. Uh, so if, if it's a quiet time at work where things have fairly calmed down or I'm just feeling really stressed or anxious, I just bring it out, start reading, go out in the sun, um, or, you know, I'm just at home, just in the garden, or um, whenever I just find time. I actually started going to things uh, and showing up to places an hour early, just so I could show up there and read for an hour before the thing. The only reason I didn't show up here an hour early was because I didn't know where I could actually sit and and read. Fair enough. Um, And I didn't (laughs) think, like, you know, gate crashing into your flat an hour (laughs) early would be quite as welcome. Yeah, my parents had a long lap, so yeah, Yeah. that's good. (laughs) So yeah, uh, definitely an ebook reader. You know, I, I mentioned a Kindle, but other devices are a- a- available and probably more preferable because then you're not giving money to Jeff Bezos. Um, but yeah, uh, an ebook reader, which you can add all kinds of your favorite stuff onto, but definitely something for me is quite important. Nice. And then finally, can you just let our listeners know where they can find you? Like, shout yourself out anything that you want to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Uh, I'm at Vivek Santayana on Twitter. Uh, find me for like random tabletop role playing games, malarkey, or corfball stuff, or generally um, political shite. I don't know. Um, I'm, I guess I'm the kind of person who's just who doesn't do social media and the internet very well. Um, so yeah. That's fair, but I can link the Twitter in the show notes in case anyone does want to get in touch, ask questions about the episode. Or just find out maybe you want to find out more about corporal or something like that then you'll have also shouted out where they can find that so thank you so much for coming on today it's been lovely to chat and um yeah thank you oh no worries thanks for having me no uh, it's been an absolute joy <laughs> <laughs> and to everyone at home you will hear from me in two weeks have a good week bye Hello and welcome or welcome back to a Fancy Abelder podcast. I am your host Kirsty Taylor and this week we are talking to Vivek who is a resident here in Edinburgh um, all about his advocacy work in particular um, that obviously he is doing at the moment and we kind of delve into other topics too related to living in the city, living in different places um, dealing with burnout and advocacy work and things similar to that so I think it's a really 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 fun episode I really enjoyed recording it I think you're all gonna love it so stay tuned for the interview but for now we're gonna hop straight into our intro so enjoy enjoy